All right, we're going to continue our summer study sermon series, the four S's, and this is going to be our fourth Sunday with the four S's, all right? So for those of you who are prophetic in the room, you can tell me what that means later. Uh, but we are going to turn back in our Bibles to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to read all together verse 37 through 47, same exact 10 verses of Scripture that we read last week if you were with us. Um, I did a message last week called Repent More. And if you were not here and you just enjoy hearing messages on repentance, which I don't know who does, but if that's you uh, and you're that anomaly, go to our YouTube, please, and watch back that message because I just really feel like God spoke in the middle of that message. I, I do. It was a good message to me. I'm going to listen to the podcast myself, all right? I think it was good. So um, verse 37 through 47 today, we're going to hit another aspect of the New Co Covenant Church. And so if you guys don't mind to stand up, verse 37, let's read together. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them. Pause just a second. I would like to point out that Peter was a long-winded preacher. So biblically, we're in order around here. <laughs> Saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Stop just right there. Just as, I just want to point this out because this is where we're going to hone in on today, okay? So everybody just say with me, the apostles' teaching. Everybody just say with me, good doctrine. good doctrine. That's where we're going today. The apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers and all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles and all who believed were together and had all things in common and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. If you don't mind to stay standing, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for your everlasting, always transformative word. Lord, we thank you for giving us a significant deposit for sowing a seed into our spiritual lives this morning that will bear much fruit. God, we ask that you would put our supernatural thinking caps on this morning as we endeavor to repent and receive your word. Anything in us that does not line up to your word, we ask that you would shake everything that could be shaken, that you would remove everything you want to remove so that we would be standing a pure and holy vessel in your sight today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. on your way to your seat, just look at your neighbor and say, I came to church for a reason this morning. Come on. I don't know about you, but I came to a church for a reason this morning. Amen, Tim? I came to church this morning for a reason. I intend to be transformed by God's word. How about you, church? I'm excited to receive it. Well, I want to look at verse 42 a little bit longer, and we see that the Bible says in the New King James, it says, and they continued steadfastly, right? That means they were consistent. That means that even when they got tired of hearing the same old thing, Sunday after Sunday, year after year, season after season, they said, no, 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 I know that this is good for me spiritually, and so I'm going to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and the fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in the prayers. And so what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about good doctrine. All right, good doctrine. I want to point that out, good 
doctrine. How many of you guys have heard that word before, doctrine? All right? Now, that's a very churchy word, isn't it? You know, we don't really say doctrine outside of the context of the church. But doctrine simply means teaching. All right? Everybody say teaching. It means teaching as well as instruction or, get this, to teach the substance which I really like that definition. To teach the substance of something. And uh, so that's what I want to talk about is what does it mean for us as believers to have good doctrine or to receive and impart good teaching and for us to year after year grow in our ability to instruct others in the substance of God's word. All right, so that's what we're going to talk about today. We talk about good doctrine. Now, uh, before I dive in, I, 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 I got to pause for a second and welcome some new friends. Blake and Emily Campbell are here with us. They are pastors at Bethany Church in Louisiana. And uh, I was getting started here and I was like, no, 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 I got to stop and I got to honor these two. This is a wonderful couple. We had coffee on Friday afternoon. And spent some time together. And I'm so excited about the next season for their life. They're going to be planting a church soon. And, um, and they just thought they would come up here and see what God's doing in our house. And hopefully receive and share and do all the good things to get inspired for what God has called them to do. So, man, I just want to say welcome. You're welcome. I'm excited about that for you guys. Super pumped. I could pause the whole message and just go on about how much I enjoyed spending time with these guys. Well, let's talk about good doctrine. So how many of you guys know that all teachings or all religions, uh, they all have what they would consider to be their own doctrines, right? Um, all cults <laughs> have their own doctrines. You know the difference between a church and a cult? Yeah, well... We're getting in trouble already. A cult gathers around the man of God and a, a church gathers around the word of God. <laughs> Just stirring the pot nicely here to start off here, okay? So we came gathering not around a person, unless you say that person is Jesus and only Jesus and his words, all right? But every, every cult has, has, has doctrines, right? Every ism has doctrines, uh, different churches, they have different doctrines, different religions, they have different doctrines. They're all founded upon various principles and doctrines. And um, doctrines can be extremely powerful. Uh, perhaps not a singular teaching in itself, but when doctrines are received, believed, practiced, and obeyed, they become very powerful as a whole. When doctrines are received, believed, practiced, and obeyed, they determine three things. Let me give you guys three things, all right? Here's what doctrines determine. Number one is our character, which is who and what we are. Number two is our actions, which is what we do. Number three is our destiny, which is where we go. That is what our doctrines will determine, these three things. Number one, our character, who and what we are. Number two is our actions, what we do. Number three is our destiny, where we will go. The teachings that you believe matter a lot. They determine three things. Number one is our character. Number two is our actions. And number three is our destiny, where we will end up. This is really important for us to understand so that we can value the doctrines that we are to receive, hold them near and dear, so that we can be sure to end up as good people, with good character, landing in good places as our destiny, and becoming good people in a holy identity. What you believe determines who you are, what you'll do, and where you'll go. 
So the doctrines you hold near and dear are very, very important. The teachings you take on are very, very powerful. They can make you or they can break you. And we see how powerful doctrine is in the book of Acts, particularly the doctrine of Jesus. Acts 5 and 28. We strictly charge you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Everybody say teaching. teaching. What are they talking about? Doctrine, right? So we see here that the doctrines of the apostles are actually quite powerful. So powerful, in fact, that they consistently burn the biscuits of all of the pharisaical religious teachers. They're like, man, this is causing us some problems. Let's look at Acts chapter 13, verse 12 again. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching. Everybody say doctrines. Doctrines of the Lord. Let's look at one more. Acts chapter 17, verse 19. And they took him and brought him to... You guys want to try that word? Uh, Aeropagus? Does that sound correct? All right, good. May we know what this new teaching is, or I say doctrine, is that you are presenting. For the believers in the book of Acts, the apostles' doctrine or the apostles' teaching were so life-giving. But for those that were religious, doctrine was actually something that caused them to be extremely fearful because they recognized that this teaching, that this doctrine was so powerful and it went against the grain of the status quo. So they understood this is a very powerful doctrine and it's important for us to investigate because the people who are teaching it while uneducated, what it is that they are teaching is so powerful that it's bringing about transformation in everybody's life who hears it. Very powerful. The apostles' doctrine is actually defined by Paul, and he calls it the doctrine of Christ. I read this to you guys last week. I want to read it again. It's from Hebrews chapter, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. Now, he lays out here the doctrine of Christ. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, and of instruction about washings. Everybody say baptisms. Because that's what we're going to do tonight. At Encounter Night. The laying on of hands. The resurrection of the dead. And the eternal judgment. This is the basic foundational teachings of the doctrine of Christ. So this is what Paul points out. He said this is what we are teaching as the doctrine of Christ. Now this is... All we ever really need to study, like we could spend the rest of our lives studying this right here, like repentance from dead works, sanctification and transformation consistently, faith toward God, baptism, baptism not only in water but also in the spirit, right? The laying on of hands, healings, miracles, signs, wonders. Dead being raised, brought back to life, come on. The resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. This is the foundation of good doctrine. Now, let me contrast good and bad doctrine for a little bit. I, th I think this is going to go over okay, but I was a little nervous when I was preparing the notes. Because my job as a shepherd is to do everything, not only in my power, but do everything that I can according to the grace that Jesus gives me to consistently Sunday in and Sunday out practice, prepare, and share good doctrine. Now, I hope that I do that well most of the time. I try. I appreciate that. But on the other side, one of the things that I have to do as an elder is confront bad doctrine and say that is not a safe thing for you to take on as a, as a teaching in your life and here's why because it's going to affect your character 
it's also going to affect your actions. It's going to affect what you're going to do. And then lastly, it's also going to affect your destiny, where it is that you'll land up. And I know what the words of the Lord over your life are. You've shared them with me. I've heard about your prophetic words. I've heard about your prophetic dreams. I've heard about those things that you really want to do with Jesus. And you're taking on doctrines that are going to move you in a direction that I don't think align with the word of God over your life. And so that's part of my job as well as a shepherd. You know, one pastor said it like this. I got to tend the sheep, man, but I also got to shoot the wolves. That's intense, isn't it? But if you ever look at a shepherd's crook, it was an instrument of care, but also an instrument of discipline. That job is difficult. I'm going to be honest with you guys. Look at Titus chapter 1, verse 9. This is the description of an elder. He says, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in, you guys say it with me, sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So what is good doctrine and what is bad doctrine? Well, let's first look at good doctrine. Good doctrine is Bible-based doctrine. Everybody say Bible-based. I know there's a lot of controversy right now in our culture over the Word of God, but here's what good doctrine is, church. It is Bible-based doctrine, all right? It is doctrine that has been founded in the Word of God. And I want you guys to know, as Legacy Church, we are never going to leave the foundation of God's holy word. We're never going to walk away from the Holy Scripture. We're never going to walk away from the Bible. We are going to consistently do everything within our power to share with you Bible-based teachings. That's why I have so many scriptures in my slides, all right? Because I know this is something that determines a lot about you. So I want, to, I want to make sure it's nourishing and it's safe. Uh, Jude chapter 1 verse 3 says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. This is something that we must do. We must contend for good, sound, pure, Bible-based doctrine. Because... You know, as Paul talks about the winds of doctrine, you guys remember that from Ephesians chapter 4, that toss little children to and fro? I can promise you this, culture, the culture of the world, is going to do everything within its power to pull us off the foundation that is the rock, that is the word of God in Christ Jesus. I can promise you that. And so that's why here in Jude we see we're receiving a reminder Hey, don't forget about the sound doctrine that was delivered to you at first. What is Jude pointing to? The apostles' doctrine. He's pointing to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. So he makes a clear appeal. He said, hey, look, guys, I know there's a lot of things that you could teach that are super entertaining. I know there's a lot of things that you could go about teaching that you, you know, have heard other people talk about or maybe they're popular. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand strong on the apostles' doctrine. I want you to stay put, stay right there. So as a minister of the gospel, I don't need to deviate onto anything else. I don't want you to get bored here. I don't think the word of God is ever bored, but to a certain extent, it should be somewhat predictable that every time you come to church, you're gonna hear the scriptures open. You're gonna hear the scriptures proclaimed. The Bible's gonna be open. That's us. So as culture gets more and more stretched out, I believe we're going to see more of a return to the basics. I really do believe that. I really believe that. Truth. In a fast-paced world, people are searching for an immovable foundation of truth, which is Jesus. I believe that. So I want you to consider this. All New Testament writings were written by the apostles. The exact same apostles uh, from Acts chapter 2 plus Paul, who is also an apostle. 
And so when we talk about the apostles' doctrine, we're talking about the full counsel of truth each and every week. New Testament scripture, Old Testament scripture, full counsel of God in the Bible. So if the apostles' doctrine is good doctrine, let's talk about what bad doctrine is. What is bad doctrine? Number one, here's what bad doctrine is. I made a list. Here's what bad doctrine is. Number one, it's the doctrines of men. Jesus called these the traditions of men in Mark 7 and 7. Paul called them the winds of doctrine that toss folks to and fro in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. And these, in fact, are, according to Colossians 2 and 22, deceptions and distractions. Look at Mark chapter 7, verse 13. The Bible says, making the word of God of no effect through your traditions... So that's what the doctrines of men are, or traditions of men. Through your traditions, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. Obviously, this is Jesus rebuking the people who are practicing the doctrines of men. Okay, what else is a bad doctrine? Number two, the doctrine of demons. Okay, I love talking about the doctrines of demons for some reasons. I'm just like, just a good rebuke, you know? So just as the serpent perverted God's word to Eve, the serpent continues to try to pervert God's word to his bride. This happens when our enemy corrupts God's word, claiming that God has said it when he hasn't. That's essentially what a doctrine of demons is. You can look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. It says, Now the Spirit expressly says... That in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciousness have been seared. It's real. These bad doctrines are literally taught by bad teachers. The Bible calls them false teachers. Now, I'm not a heresy hunter. I want you to know right now. I'm not constantly online looking for somebody's post to comment on to rebuke them. Let me give you one point on how to rebuke somebody online. Don't. Just, Just stop. Just don't do it. Don't do it. The Bible calls them false teachers. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. What we see here is a pointing out of what a false teacher is. False teachers essentially do one thing through many expressions. They corrupt God's incorruptible word. That's what false teachers do. And I'll give you a list. Uh, The first one is they handle God's word deceitfully with impure motives. So they're, they're, they're presenting truth, but their words create the wrong atmosphere. You ever felt that before? Sometimes, like, you're hearing scripture read, but there's something about the spirit that doesn't bear witness with your spirit. You know what I'm talking about. Do you remember the the, uh, fortune-telling demoniac gal in Acts chapter 15 that was following the apostles around proclaiming truth? What she was saying was true. But her words were creating the wrong environment. Handling the truth with the wrong motives will create the wrong environment where it will distort what God actually wants to do through people's character, through people's actions, and through people's destinies. So one of the things false teachers do is they handle God's word deceitfully. Secondly, they are unlearned and they twist God's word to meet their own interpretations. I could spend the rest of my time talking about that right there. If you want to teach God's word, God's word says that you endeavor to do a good thing. But if you have a desire to teach God's word, let me ask you also to develop a drive 
to study God's word and the interpretations of that word that have pre-existed you and have existed throughout church history for the last several thousand years. The whole counsel of God. All right. Thirdly, they add to God's word. They add things. Lastly, they, they preach another Jesus. Just a different Jesus than the one that we find in the word. A false teacher works under Satan whether they know it or not. That's a bummer, isn't it? That's false teachers. I share this because the Bible does. I'm not trying to heresy hunt today. I'm not trying to call anybody out. I'm not trying to name any names or be mean to anybody. I'm not, all right? If in the context of a relational conversation, which could happen here, could happen in some other context, if you're like, hey, do you think I should be listening to the teachings of so-and-so? I will be honest with you and I'll say, no. I wouldn't recommend that. But I'm not ever going to do that from the stage. I, it just, it's not going to happen. So if you're looking for that, this ain't your spot. All right? But I will be honest with you as a pastor to say, hey, I don't think that that's wise for you to be listening to those teachings because that's going to determine who you become. It's going to determine what you do. And it's ultimately going to determine where you go. And I don't think you're going to end up in a good place. And here's why I would share something like that, perhaps because of this list here. Or perhaps because of my experience watching other people follow those teachings and now looking at where they've ended up and examining the spiritual fruit of their life and saying, I just don't think that leads to a good place. If you're ever wondering about a teacher, like, should I listen to their teachings? Go look at the lifestyle of the people who do. And then ask yourself, do I want to be like them? Because if you don't, you should mute them. And if you don't, you should be careful because you will. You will. I'm sharing this because the Bible does. And, and it, is, is, it is truly coming from a place of like a shepherd's heart wanting to protect you. So all throughout the early church, the apostles warned the church about false doctrines. All throughout the New Testament, you'll see the apostles actually warning people about false doctrines. Because they understood the power of doctrines. Every single doctrine that exists ultimately flows from one of two sources. You guys got to get this point. All right. Ultimately, every doctrine that exists flows from one of two sources. All right. And I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. The channels may vary, but the sources remain the same. All doctrines that we have either come from God or they come from the enemy. Notice that I did not say flesh and blood. All right, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. It's doctrine, the channels may vary, but the sources remain the same. They either come from God or they come from the enemy. They either come from the Holy Spirit, which the Bible calls the spirit of truth, or they come from Satan, which the Bible calls the spirit of error. Flows from one of two sources, not flesh and blood. Remember, people will teach from the spirit they receive. People will teach from the spirit that they receive. From Genesis, the enemy's purpose has remained the same, which is to deceive, and he does so through doctrines and various teachings. The enemy is an imitator. He does this because God's purpose is to reveal truth through good doctrines. If the teachings you hear do not match up to the doctrine of Christ, the very simple elementary doctrine of Christ that you find in the Gospels, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, it is not from God and you don't have to entertain it. All right? I've, I've understood that the older I get, the simpler I get. Well, I want to talk to you about all these different philosophies. I'm good. I, I found, I found the one. I'm good. So what is good doctrine? We talk about bad doctrine. Let's not focus on the bad. Let's focus on the good. What's good doctrine? That's what I want to go through in the time we have left. Number one is this. Good doctrine is sound. All right? That's what the Bible says. It's sound. Sound doctrine is healthy for us. It's healthy for us. Uh, You can look at Titus chapter 2 verse 1. This is an instruction to eldership. But as for you, teach 
what accords with sound doctrine. Not teaching everything under the sun. We are teaching what is sound. 2 Timothy 4 and 3 says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. I think that time has come. They'll not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers... And those teachers may have PhDs. They may have decades of experience. They may have resumes a mile long. Gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. This is is why I tell people, listen, don't go to the church you feel comfortable in. Go to the church you, you are called to. Because here's the thing, you're, every now and then there's going to come a Sunday, and there's a lot of them here, where you're going to hear something that you're not going to like, but God will speak and say, this is what you need. This is healthy. This is healthy for you. It might, it might hurt a little bit, but it's healthy. It might hurt a little bit, but it's healthy. That's sound doctrine. Number two, what is good doctrine? Good doctrine is pure It's pure. Job chapter 11 verse 14 says this. If you put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent. This is the result of pure doctrine. Pure doctrine. It is you live a life of consistent sanctification. This is how you know you're being fed pure doctrine. Are you you increasing or decreasing in your lifestyle of sinfulness? As you are receiving pure doctrine, you increase in righteousness. You increase in sanctification. You increase in holiness. We don't allow sin to dwell in our homes anymore as the result of being fed a steady diet of pure doctrine. No, no, we're getting that stuff out of here. Bad doctrine is impure and it always allows and it encourages sin to continue to dwell. We were talking about this yesterday. Maddie and I were talking about this yesterday about doctrines and how they have affected us in our past. And we were talking about uh, different heresies that have been popularized while we've been alive. And us receiving them because they felt good at first glance and then recognizing a few months down the road, hold on, wait just a second. I've become a little bit more tolerant of sin and impurity in my life and I don't seem to be growing in righteousness in the way that God's designed me to. This is not a good doctrine. This isn't pure. I gotta get this out of here. Number three, good doctrine is scriptural. Notice here, the whole scripture too. I'm not talking about cherry picking passages to fit the itching ears, right? (laughs) I would like to preach this to the entirety of my following on Instagram. Y'all should see my DMs every now and then. But this scripture, I'm like, there's three other scriptures here that talk about this. You know, like you can't just cherry pick one and try to use it to rebuke me. (laughs) It's fun though. It it keeps me on my toes. I don't really mind it, to be honest with you. 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17. This is a lot of scripture here about the whole of scripture. But it says this, but as for you, continue in what you have learned, learned and firmly believed knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. I don't know who this is hitting, but somebody in here, I'm sure, you're like, I grew up in church. Not all of it was bad. Right? I grew up in a weird church. I did. Not all of it was bad. They, ha- they did have a few weird doctrines. But you know what I learned about? I learned about the power of God. I learned about miracles. I, you know? So, I don't know, I was reading that this week, and I was like, I think that's going to be for somebody in here. You know, not all of your Sunday school is bad, all right? Just a reminder. Take what is good. Eat the meat, spit out the bones, right? Which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture, everybody say all Scripture. All Scripture, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped, for every good work. Doesn't that sound like the three things? 
that good doctrine does, right, determines who we are, what we'll do, where we'll go, right? To be equipped for every good work. That's the implication that doctrine has on your life. 2 Timothy 2 and 15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling... So what does it look like to be an approved worker in the kingdom of God? Rightly handling the word of truth. Number four, good doctrine must be obeyed. When you understand truth, you obey truth. I've hit on this so many times, I feel like, but our culture today is so much different than Jesus' culture at the time he was teaching. Um, to hear something, to hear truth, meant to obey truth, right? So even in Hebrew culture, they have a prayer. It's the most basic, fundamental, foundational prayer. It's called the Shema, right? And it says, Shema, which means hear, right? Shema, O Israel, which is hear, O Israel. You guys know this. The Lord our God is one Lord, right? And so the way they saw it was, if you didn't listen and obey to what was spoken, then you didn't hear it at all. Which is why they kicked off with hear. The implication was don't just listen, but prepare yourself to obey it. Remember, the goal of a good message is not your conviction. The goal of a good message is your transformation. Right? I, I, I love it when you walk out convicted, but the goal of the sermon is not your conviction. The goal of God's message, God's word in your life is for you to be transformed. That's, that's what good doctrine does. It must be obeyed. Romans chapter 6 verse 17 said, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. What did he say? Obedient from the heart. You know, what Jesus did is he warned us of the leaven of the Pharisee. You know what that is? Religious doctrines that are based upon tradition, despite being true, are never obeyed. Let me say it another way. The doctrine of the Pharisees was simply this. They were preaching truth that they never obeyed. I want you to understand something about the Pharisees. They were right. You got, you got to understand. Like, these guys were right, man. They were smarter than all of us, guys. They could quote the Pentateuch from memory. That's the first five books of the Bible. That's wild, okay? They were very smart. But how many of you guys know, like, you can be so right and so wrong at the same time. They were constantly giving the people truth, truth. Here's the truth. Here's the truth. Here's the truth. Here's the letter of the law. Here's what the word says. It is written. This is what it is. Yes, they were right, but wrong at the same time because what they were doing is what Jesus preached against, which was they were presenting truth, but never, in fact, obeying truth. Good doctrine must be obeyed. They taught it, but they didn't live it. Number five is this. Good doctrines make for good character. And I've already hit on this, so I'll cruise through it quickly. But following good doctrine produces God's nature and God's character within us. What we believe determines who we become. What you believe determines who you become. 2 Timothy 3 and 10 on that point. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. This is, this is Paul writing to his son in the spirit, Timothy, right? He's saying, look, it's not just about what I teach. It's also about what I do, and it's also about who I become. Do you guys see that? My teaching, not only my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. Like, we, we need more from our leaders than a good sermon. We need a holy life. We need a righteous way of living. We need good conduct, good behavior. Hey, how about being nice despite being anointed? How about being joyful? How about smiling at people when you see them in public? 
Justin's here today. We've talked about this before. We're like, man, we don't mess with no anointed jerks. If the anointing can empower you to heal, the anointing can empower you to be kind. <laughs> All right, number six, good doctrine brings biblical fellowship. If you look back on the passage we read today, we see that good doctrine coincides with good fellowship. And um, if you look, I'm going to contrast that a little bit with 2 John uh, chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. The Bible says, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you, what, is he, what teaching is he talking about here, church? The apostles' doctrine. The doctrine that was given at first. The doctrine of Christ. The doctrine that the Bible gives to us. All right, go on, we'll go on. So if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him anything. Don't even give him a greeting. Now, this is a teacher. This is a false teacher saying, hey, let me give you a good word. But it doesn't line up with the word of God. No, I'm good. I'm not even going to greet you. I'm not even going to follow you on socials. In fact, I'm going to unfollow you. I'm going to get you out of my orbit, man. Just, just a pastoral recommendation. Just a, just a pastoral. Go through the follower list. Stuff, anti-biblical stuff. Just don't follow them. You have permission. I'm giving you a permission slip. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Number seven, good doctrine, almost finished. Good doctrine creates God-blessed destiny. Is, is the best way I know how to say it. All roads do not lead to heaven. They don't. False religions and cults, they might be zealous, they might be sincere, but the Bible teaches us that they are sincerely wrong, and it's okay to acknowledge that. You can still love them and not be in agreement with their doctrines. There's only one way, church, and I know we know this. You guys are the 9, 9 a.m., like you're the all-in committed crowd, like you get up early and come to church. I know you know this. But there's only one way, which is Jesus. And outside of Jesus, there is truly only darkness and death. All right, last point. Good doctrine, church, always leads to more love. More love. 1 Corinthians 13 and 2 says, And if I have prophetic powers and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Notice he didn't say that prophetic powers were nothing. Notice he didn't say that understanding mysteries were nothing. Notice that he didn't say having good, sound, biblical knowledge was nothing. Or that faith was nothing. But that he was nothing if he did not collaborate all of the good knowledge and the doctrine that he had received with the wisdom and the love of Jesus. Good doctrine causes us to love more. The truth has to be held in love. A friend of mine says that anytime you're going to present truth that's hard, do so on a platter called grace. Serve it up in love. We cannot become so legalistic about our doctrines, church, that we alienate everybody that doesn't submit to God's teachings. It's not about that. At the end of the day, who cares about our teachings? The only teachings we need to be preoccupied with are those of Jesus. Not our traditions, none of that. So I want to see us growing up in good doctrine. All right? I know that was kind of a, that was a legacy college session, I think. All right, let's stand up. We're going to pray. As we're standing up, we're going to pray. Um, I want you to examine where you might be on your journey of growing in good doctrine, all right? I want you to examine where you might be. Uh, the Bible actually talks about levels of growth and maturity. Number one is little children, which are literally babes in Christ, right? They're new believers. Someone that's a little child is unable to feed themselves, right? So they're dependent upon other people to feed them sound doctrine. 
Number two is young men and young women. These people are able to feed themselves, but they're not yet ready to feed other people. And the third level is moms and dads. This is the mature bunch that is able not only to feed themselves, but also able to feed others. And listen, you don't have to have gray hairs to become a mom and dad to somebody in the spirit. All right, you might be 21, you can adopt a 14 year old. All right, 15 year old. You might be 40, you can adopt a 30 year old. And maybe you don't adopt somebody who's numerically younger than you are, but maybe they just got saved recently and they're 65, right? This faith church is not about staying in infancy only depending upon other people to feed us. No, no, we gotta get in the word throughout the week. We gotta grow throughout the week. We gotta pray throughout the week, right? It's not only even about learning to do that, but it's about going on into a place of growth and maturity where we can actually feed other people and teach others good and sound doctrine. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 and 11, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. And that's for all of us. You know, if we were in a actual physical fight for our lives. I'm talking about real warfare. And the only weapon that you had at your disposal was a long sword. How many guys would let that thing collect dust and rust on the mantle? So why do we do that with our Bibles? Right? We have the family Bible. It's open to Psalm 91. I love it. But turn it every now and then. Eat what's in those pages every now and then. Learn to wield the sword so that when you get into a fight, muscle memory kicks in. And you can be like Jesus when he was tempted of Satan and said, but it is written. I hear what you're saying, enemy, but it is written. Yeah, I hear what you're trying to do to me, hell, but it's written. Maturity. So, Lord, I just pray right now for each and every person that we would all grow up into a place of maturity in the Spirit, God, that we would not be people that are completely dependent upon our leadership to feed us on a Sunday, but that we would eat consistently throughout the week, day in and day out, that we would wake up with an insatiable hunger to go after God, to dive into God's Word and to get sound and pure doctrines that come from you, that come from what the Bible has to say Lord I speak against any and all confusion as well any and all temptation that comes from the enemy I speak against it today and I just declare that your people they're, they're, they will be built upon the rock sure footing psalmist said make us like hinds feet even when it gets crazy that we'd have sure footing Lord I pray that over this house in Jesus mighty name and everybody said I receive good doctrine. Amen. Come on. Can we just bless the Lord as we're closing?